Tale of Peter Rabbit, published in 1902, was Beatrix Potter's first book, and expanded from an illustrated letter she had sent to a young friend who was ill at the time. One hundred years later, the classic tale of naughty Peter Rabbit's escape from Mr. McGregor's garden still brings children all over the world the pleasure it gave that very first reader. Peter lived with his mother and sisters, Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail. He was always being told he could play anywhere in the woods, but must not go into Mr. McGregor's garden, because his father was caught there and put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. On one particular day, his three sisters ran down the lane to collect blackberries, but Peter, who was in the mood for mischief, ran straight to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. He danced among the lettuces and carrots, eating something from every plot, having a wonderful time greedily stuffing himself until he had a tummy ache. Mr. McGregor saw him and made chase, but Peter Rabbit eventually outwitted him and safely returned back under the gate by the woods, where he danced with his sisters, happy at not being caught. This time, they all ran home again as fast as they could scamper. His mother put him to bed after a dose of chamomile tea. As she gave him the medicine, he didn't like the taste and gulped then shivered. His mother said, Too many blackberries, one large spoonful to be taken at bedtime. Good night, Peter Rabbit.
The tale of Jemima Puddle Duck was influenced by the lakeland surroundings of Hilltop Farm. Jemima was a real duck on the farm where Potter worked, who wasn't good at hatching her eggs, and Beatrix Potter's favorite sheepdog named Cap features as the wise friend who rescues Jemima from the deceptively charming, sandy-whiskered gentleman, Mr. Todd. What a funny sight! To see a brood of ducklings following a hen? The farmer's wife would not let Jemima Puddle Duck hatch her own eggs, because she wouldn't have the patience to sit for 28 days. She was a very fidgety duck. Jemima was determined to make her own nest away from the farm where no one could find them and take them from her. So she set off along the cart road wearing a shawl and a poke bonnet. From the top of the hill, she saw a wood in the distance. She thought that looked a safe and quiet spot for her nest. She took a long run fast to the edge of the hill and then flew over the farm and the treetops until she saw an open place in the wood where she came down with a bumpity bump, fluffed her feathers, straightened her bonnet, blinked her dusty eyes, and looked around. When she had caught her breath, she thought some foxgloves might be a good place, but when she came near, she saw an elegantly dressed gentleman sitting on a rock and reading a newspaper. Madam, have you lost your way? He greeted her with a sly smile. Jemima thought him very civil and handsome. She explained she was looking for a nesting place for her eggs. Ah, oh, is that so? Indeed, said the gentleman with the sandy whiskers, looking curiously at Jemima. Jemima told him of her story and of the sitting hen. He said he wished he could meet that hen and teach it to mind its own business. And so he offered her his woodshed and a huge bag of feathers to make her nest. After all, she was a new friend, and that's what friends are for. He wooed and charmed his way into her heart that day and danced with her under the light of the moon, both were happy for her nesting place and the eggs, for different reasons, I'm sure. He showed her to the shed, which didn't smell too pleasant, but there was a lovely soft downy bed of feathers for her nest. She snuggled down and smiled. This would be ideal. He promised to watch over her nest when she wasn't there as she lay her eggs. Ugh. He loved eggs and ducklings. Jemima came over to the nest shed for the next few days and laid nine eggs. Mr. Todd admired them immensely. He offered to cook her a lovely meal before she began her egg sitting and told her to bring some sage and onion from the garden the next day. Cap the Collie asked her what she was doing, and she told him the whole story he knew what was happening. Kep took his two friends, the foxhounds, over to where Mr. Todd's woodshed was and saved Jemima's life. But, unfortunately, her eggs got eaten by the hounds. They thought it was their just reward, so be careful who your friends are, especially if they have sandy whiskers.
got the friend in me You got the friend in me You got troubles I got them too There ain't nothing that I won't do for you You got a problem, we can see it through Cause you got a friend in me Yes, you got a friend in me Some of the people might be A little bit smarter than I am A little bit stronger too But none of them Just me and you, boy And as the years go by Our friendship will never die You're gonna see it's our destiny Cause you got a friend in me Yes, 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 you got a friend in me Come on might be a little bit smarter than I am, a little bit stronger too, but none of them will ever love you the way that I do, just me and you, boy, and as the years go by, our friendship will never die, you're gonna see it's our destiny. Cause you got a friend in me I said you got a friend in me I said you got a friend in me Jeremy Fisher began its life as an illustrated letter to a young child. It was written when she was on holiday in Scotland where her father and friends enjoyed fishing expeditions. Mr Fisher had a day full of the worst fisherman's mishaps when he set out to catch minnows for his dinner. Mr Jeremy Fisher lived in a little damp house amongst the buttercups at the edge of a pond. Water covered the floors, but Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet. Nobody ever scalded him, and he never caught a cold. He was never happier than to see the raindrops start to fall, splashing into the pond, and even happier when there was a rainbow too to light up his home. He liked nothing better than to dance on the lily pads and practice his leaps and twirls. One lovely rainbow-lit, rainy, sunny day, he stood in his doorway and looked to the sky with a broad smile. I will get some worms and go fishing to catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, he said. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends, Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise and Sir Isaac Newton. The Alderman, however, only eats salad. Jeremy danced amongst the lily pads to find the best place before settling to catch his fish. Then he sat for a long time and caught nothing. But the dragonflies hummed around his head and he ate butterfly sandwiches for his lunch. And still he caught no minnows. While he was pondering his utter bad luck, something dreadful happened. A huge trout pulled him from the lily pad and swallowed him whole. But he tasted so bad in his Macintosh, the trout spat him out again, and all it swallowed was his galoshes. Jeremy swam to the edge of the pond, quite exhausted and upset, but fortunate to have escaped. He still invited his friends to dinner, 
and the eight roasted grasshopper with ladybird sauce all washed down with some cowslip wine. But no minnows. The first farm that Beatrix Potter owned was Hilltop Farm. It was an old house with thick walls and many hiding places for rats and mice. In the tale of Samuel Whiskers, this farmhouse is Tom Kitten's home. The story tells of when Tom accidentally comes upon the rat Samuel Whiskers living in a secret hideout behind the attic walls. Tabitha Twitchett was an anxious parent and often losing her kittens. They were always into mischief. The house where they lived also had a family of rats, and they were always stealing things for their dinner from the Twitchett's larder. One day, Moppet came crying to her mother, Mother! Mother! There was an old woman rat stealing the dough for our muffins from the kitchen. Then Mittens came crying to her mother, saying, Oh, mother, mother, there has been an old man rat in the dairy, a dreadful, enormous, big rat, mother, and he has stolen a pat of butter and a rolling pin. Tom Kitten had disappeared up the chimney. He was covered in soot and eventually tumbled through a hole into the attic walls where the rats lived. The enormous fat rat sat in front of him, very grumpy, and frowned when he saw Tom. Anna Maria, come quick and make me a kitten roly-poly pudding. They tied Tom Kitten up so he couldn't escape, and both went to fetch the other ingredients for the roly-poly pudding. Then they wrapped him in dough and were ready to bake him for their feast. 
Tom Kitten bit and spat and meowed and wriggled, and the rolling pin went roly-poly-roly. Roly. A joiner had been asked to repair the roof of the attic. He found Tom Kitten there tied and meowing for his mother, so he was able to rescue the frightened kitten. As for Samuel Whiskers and Anna Maria, there was no roly-poly pudding, and Anna Maria so loved Samuel that she fed him bread and cheese that day instead, because all Samuel loved was his food. The tale of Mr. Todd brings back Beatrix Potter's most popular heroes, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny, in a new adventure that also includes two particularly disagreeable villains. Fortunately, Tommy Brock the Badger and Mr. Todd the Fox dislike each other so much that when Tommy Brock kidnaps Benjamin's young family, Mr. Todd unwittingly becomes the rabbit's ally. Miss Potter has made many books about well-behaved people, and now for a change, she has made a story about two disagreeable people called Tommy Brock and Mr. Todd. Nobody could call Mr. Todd nice. The rabbits didn't like the way he smelled. He was a wanderer, and no one knew where he would turn up next, or what trouble he would bring. He has had many homes, but didn't stay in any for long. When Mr. Todd moved out, Tommy Brock always moved in. He was also not nice, and ate wasp nests, and frogs, and worms. His clothes were dirty, and he also smelled funny. 
Tommy Brock's favorite food was rabbit pie. One day he sat in the sunshine conversing with Mr. Bouncer, Benjamin Bunny's father, whose new grand bunnies had not long been born. He was supposed to be looking after them, but had forgotten all about them, and after he had shared a glass of cowslip wine and seed cake with Tommy Brock, he smoked a cigar and fell asleep. When he woke, Tommy had gone, and so had the baby bunnies. When Benjamin came home to find them gone, he immediately dashed off to find Peter, so they could try and find Tommy Brock and rescue the baby bunnies before it was too late. They followed a trail of a particularly nasty smell with their keen noses that led them to Mr. Todd's house. He was nowhere to be seen but they heard snoring coming from his bedroom. Tommy Brock had moved himself in, and on the kitchen table was laid a pie tin and ingredients for making a pie. The baby rabbits had been hidden well, but Benjamin and Peter were determined to rescue them before they could be eaten by the badger. Meanwhile, Mr. Todd returned from his walk and was very angry to find Tommy Brock in his bed so he planned to shake him up before fighting with him to get his home back. In an angry battle that took place, and while Mr. Todd and Tommy Brock were occupied in trying to kill each other, Peter and Benjamin found and rescued the babies and they were all saved. The enemies fell down the hill, tussling and biting, and no one knew what became of them after the fight. Some say they fell into the lake and drowned. Some say they became partners in crime. Because sometimes there was a very, I mean, very awfully nasty smell in the air.
As a child, Beatrix Potter had known a charming old Scottish country washerwoman called Kitty MacDonald. In the tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle, the heroine Lucy meets a similar small, round, twinkly-eyed washerwoman, but this one has prickles under her cap and does the laundry for some surprising customers. Lucy lived on a farm. She was a good little girl, but was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day, she realized it was gone again, so she asked the farm animals if they had found it, the kitten, the hen, and many others. Then she asked the robin who sat on the fence, and as soon as she had spoken, he looked at her and flew off above the stile and away. The little bird flew up high into the hills, and Lucy ran after her, trying to keep up, wondering if she was taking her to her lost handkerchief. Soon she grew tired and stopped at a little pond with a spring bubbling out from the hillside. There was a very small tin can upon a stone catching some of the falling water, but it was already running over the top, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup. The sand around the pond was wet, and she saw some tiny footprints, so she followed them down a sandy path. The path ended under a big rock, and all around the grass was short, and there were tiny clothes props made from bracken stems and twine scattered around in a clearing. The tiniest of clothes hung smartly on the lines. Lucy thought, this very strange. Then she saw a door in the hillside and could hear singing from inside the little house there. Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between, oh. Lucy knocked and opened the door to a small, neat kitchen. Everything was tidy and in its place. And with an iron in her hand stood a very stout, short person looking anxiously at Lucy. Her nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle. And underneath her hair cap, this little person had prickles. Lucy saw many items for small animals who lived around the hillside hanging to air in the warm kitchen, and was pleased to find a few of her own missing things, too, all washed, starched, and ironed to perfection. That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. When their search was over for all Lucy's lost things, Mrs. Tiggywinkle made some fresh tea and laid cakes for herself and Lucy and sat by the fire to share it. Then they danced a lovely reel together before getting ready to deliver all the clean laundry to the little houses across the hillside. Now some people said that Lucy fell asleep and had a wonderful dream. But then how could she have found her three pocket hankins and a penny, all pinned together with a tiny silver safety pin?
Tale of Squirrel Nutkin is set on Derwent Water and is based on an American story about squirrels traveling on little rafts using their bushy tails as sails. Squirrel Nutkin sails across the lake with his cousins to gather nuts on Owl Island, where his impudence to Old Brown, the owl, leads him into serious trouble. Squirrel Nutkin lived on the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake, there was an island covered with trees and nut bushes, and in a big hollow tree, there lived an owl called Old Brown. One day, Squirrel Nutkin and his six cousins decided to go gather nuts on the island and made little rafts, using their tails as sails and carrying a little bag to carry the nuts home in. They also took with them three fat mice as a gift for Old Brown and asked politely if they could gather nuts on his island. But Nutkin was very rude and jumped up and down singing a riddle at Old Brown who ignored him and went to sleep. They danced and tumbled and gathered lots of nuts, then sailed home happy after a good day's work for their winter store. The next few days, they did the same, taking with them always a gift of food for Old Brown and asking politely his permission to gather there. And each time, Nutkin played the fool and taunted Old Brown with his riddles and dancing around him laughing. Nutkin never took a present for him, but his cousins always did, and they worked hard gathering their nuts. But Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played nine pins with a crab apple. As the days continued, Old Brown became thoroughly annoyed with Nutkin's impertinent behavior, but still said nothing. Finally, his patience broke when Nutkin leaped at him in one of his taunting games, and with a scuffle and a screech, he grappled Nutkin down and hid him in his waistcoat for skinning later. The squirrels all wondered where Nutkin was, and he just managed to escape with half a tail, the other half left in Old Brown's beak as they set sail for home. He never returned to the island, and if you ever see a feisty red squirrel up a tree, beware! He will throw sticks at you and shout riddles screeching very loud. Nutkin is a very naughty squirrel.
The Tale of Pigling Bland was published in 1913, the year Beatrix Potter married and settled down to farming life for good. But she had already been keeping pigs, and she sketched them for this story, using her own farmyard as the setting. One little black pig was a household pet, and features as the perfectly lovely pigwig who runs away with Pigling Bland. Aunt Petty Toes had a family of eight piglets, four girls and four boys. One was called Pigling Bland. At last the day came for Pigling Bland and his brother Alexander to leave home and go to market. Now, Pigling Bland, said Aunt Petty Toes, take your brother Alexander by the hand. Mind your Sunday clothes and remember to blow your nose. Observe signposts and milestones and do not gobble herring bones. And remember, if you once cross the county boundary, you cannot come back. Then she gave them both a licence each to show at market. Well, the two pigs' journey wasn't a pleasant one. They ate their lunch far too early. Alexander lost his licence and was sent back to the farm. And Pigling Bland had to continue alone. He got lost and tired and hungry. Then came upon a cottage in the hills. The owner took him in, but was planning to fatten him up to sell for himself at market. Pigling Bland rested and ate the porridge the man had made him. The next day, whilst the man had taken some chickens to market, Pigling Bland could hear noises coming from a cupboard. When he opened it, he saw a beautiful lady pig. Her name was Pigwig. She too had been captured by the man and was supposed to be going to market to be sold as ham. They both quickly made a plan and ran away from the cottage that night whilst the man was asleep. They ran and ran as fast as could be until they came to the bridge and the county boundary and skipped over it happily, freedom at last. Over the hills and far away she danced with Pigling Bland. They danced down the lane, Pigling Bland singing, We shall be married and grow potatoes, and Pigwig shouted, And flowers too!
Beatrix Potter had owned Hilltop Farm in the village of Near Sorry for a year when she began work on The Tale of Tom Kitten. She shows Tom and his sisters getting into mischief amongst the flowers of the beautiful cottage garden that she had created herself. Three little kittens, Tom, Mittens and Moppet, all tumbled about and played in the dust. One day, their mother, Tabitha Twitchit, expected friends for tea, so she fetched the kittens indoors to wash and dress them nicely. She scrubbed faces, brushed fur, and combed tails. But Tom was naughty and scratched all the way through the task. First, she scrubbed their faces. This one is Moppet. Then she scrubbed their fur. This one is Mittens. Then she combed their tails. This one is Tom. The girls were dressed in clean pinafores and tuckers, and then she took some uncomfortable clothes out to dress Tom. Tom Kitten was a pudgy thing and growing fast so his buttons were bursting and his clothes were tight. When they were clean and ready, she foolishly let them outside to be out of the way while she prepared tea. Now keep your frocks clean, children. You must walk on your hind legs. Keep away from the ash pit and from Sally Hennypenny and from the pigsty and the puddle ducks. They first tried very hard to walk properly, but tumbled and fell, and their clothes became spoiled with grass and dirt. They climbed walls and rolled down hills, as kittens do. Tom Kitten was a total mess when he climbed the wall, and Mittens and Moppet who had both lost their torn clothes by now, helped him remove his dirty, ripped clothes. The puddle ducks found the clothes and tried them all on, waddling down the road in hats and stolen attire. What a sight to see! When their mother found all her naughty kittens sitting on the wall without clothes, their fur all messy and very dirty and straggled. She became angry and dragged them home, sending them to bed. She told her friends they had measles, but we know that wasn't true. And they were not in bed either. They were climbing and jumping and dancing around the room, fighting with pillows and pulling down curtains. The noises from above made the tea party very awkward for Tabitha Twitchit. So much so, she had to lie down afterwards with her paw across her head and her whiskers twitching uncontrollably.
The story of Miss Moppet was a book intended for very young children and originally published in a pull-out concertina format. It was subsequently released as a standard book as the long strip of pictures became damaged too easily. Miss Moppet was a curious kitten. She once heard a mouse. But the mouse was not afraid of a kitten at all, and teased and taunted Miss Moppet, who fell and bumped her head whilst trying to catch the mouse to play with. So she decided to rest by the fire with a scarf on her head. The mouse thought Miss Moppet was looking ill, and so came sliding down the bell pull. The mouse came nearer to see if she was okay because she was sitting very still. Miss Moppet saw the mouse from the corner of her eye and pretended not to as the mouse came closer and closer. Then suddenly Miss Moppet jumped to catch the mouse. And because the mouse has teased Miss Moppet, Miss Moppet thinks she will tease the mouse. She patted and toyed with the mouse as he did her, catching him in her scarf and throwing it up in the air until the mouse dropped through the hole in the scarf and scurried away up the sideboard leg and danced a jig on top of the cupboard. Miss Moppet sighed a whiskery defeat and jumped upon the cupboard and danced with him.
the animals of Hilltop Farm all enjoyed their lives and stories together. Their adventures and discoveries, the camaraderie and even the battles made them who they are. So much so that they enjoyed their friendships and in a strange way, their enemies too. As they all come together to celebrate the world of Beatrix Potter, the wonderful writer who created each one of them for the pleasure of so many children and adults all over the world. They dance in harmony under a moonlit sky in the countryside they all know and love and we have all shared with them today. Beatrix Potter, we thank you for your works and the inspiration for this performance of spoken word, music, dance and light. Bye. 